Hello, everyone. Uh, suppose good morning, good afternoon, uh, or even good evening for some of you. Um, my name is Tuyam on part of the Resin Bio team, and uh, welcome again to what is now the third episode of our Emerge um, webinar series. And so we're going to kick off things by the usual uh, housekeeping announcements. Um, we are recording the session. I'm going to make this available uh, for all of you to view at your own leisure afterwards. Um, this will be uh, possible if you access our website via uh, the info section or directly via YouTube. Just search for Resin Bio and you will find a playlist with previous Emerge episodes as well. Um, Please post your questions in the QA Q and A section. We'll have plenty of time to address this after the presentation. Um, we also want to make this uh, platform and webinar as interactive as possible. And so, if you would like to uh, have your question or comments live, uh, you can do so. Uh, just use the raise hand icon, and I will activate your microphone after the presentation, so we can have a bit of a chat and a discussion around the topic of. Uh, quality control and proteomics. Um, we're also going to try out the polls for the first time. We'll see how that goes. Hopefully, initiate some discussion as well. So look out for those coming through um, the presentation as well as the use of the chat option where we can post comments and questions and hopefully hear from you uh, what kind of environments you've set up in your lab when it comes to proteomics and, and quality control. And so um, to the speaker today, uh, Julia Robbins, um, She's actually the first speaker from outside of Europe, from across the pond in the US. She's based in the West Coast in, um, um, in Seattle, University of Washington. And um, she completed the Bachelor of Science there in 2018 and subsequently joined the McCoss lab. Um, and, um, you know, I think most of you on this platform know the McCoss lab quite well. They've been big proponents of, of quality control. Uh, for proteomics, and it's not surprising that in the last, I would say, what, three, three and a half, four years, the major focus of Julia's work has been on, you know, implementing these controls in quantitative proteomics in order to assess and validate um, the experimental methods and quality of the data. And she's been doing this in the space of uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases as well as age related diseases. And so today um, we're going to hear some about some of our work, some of our do's and don'ts. Um, when it comes to acquiring uh, you know, larger data sets and processing them and looking at the quality and some of the quality control solutions so she's implemented. So well, first of all, good morning, Julia. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, it's morning. awesome. And I, I look forward to your presentation and, and the subsequent um, discussion to it. All right, well, thank you. Good morning, everybody, or evening or afternoon or whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, it's morning here, um, although it's my understanding that it's like uh, dinner time, perhaps, in Europe, so that's different. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'm grateful and excited to be able to present for you guys. I was, I felt very um, honored to be asked to do this, considering that I am, I'm a uh, but a lowly staff scientist. Um, anyway, I will um, share my screen. And then I will do this. And then this. And then, okay. Just gonna adjust a few things. Apologies for the technical adjustments. Okay, that seems like it's reasonable. Okay, sorry, I just need to move a few things around. <laughs> um, all right, there we go. Okay, uh, as Stoyan said, my name is Julia Robbins. Um, I work in the McCoss lab uh, in the genome sciences department at the University of Washington. Worked there for like four years. Most of my stuff has been on neuro neurodegenerative research. A lot of focus on method development in terms of coming up with uh, sample prep, like protocols uh, specifically, like for like brain tissue, CSF, stuff like that. Um, and one of the things that we encountered along the way was uh, optimizing how to optimize and how to optimize quickly and how to actually assess whether or not our optimizing 
meant anything. Um, so yeah, this is uh, controls for quantitative proteomics experiments, aka how to mass spec responsibly, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so a universal truth is that things can and occasionally will go wrong. And especially in science, it doesn't matter that it did go wrong, it matters where it went wrong. Um, and unfortunately for methodological, financial, and perhaps moral reasons, um, stabbing in the dark isn't generally a feasible technique for addressing the issue, um, unless you have just piles and piles and piles of money, in which case more power to you. Um, so isolating uh, problem areas quickly is important. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with meant much of this, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about it anyway, but there are many ways in which a quantitative proteomic experiment can go wrong. And this list is uh, definitely not exhausted, so exhaustive. So this is including, but not limited to uh, sample preparation issues. So just issues with your digestion itself, um, unidentified batch effects. Cause you know, if you've got a bigger data set, more data, yay, but also more problems, less yay. You know, if you've, if you've got more samples there's gonna be a higher chance of individual error also, it's going to increase your MS runtime, which just statistically is going to raise your chances of something going wrong. Um, and also LCMS system failures, of which they are abundant. Um, so all of this can convolute your experiment, and uh, quantitative experiments are especially susceptible. It is one thing to observe a variation in quantity. It's another to actually be able to determine with some confidence that it has anything to do with your hypothesis. Um, and it's also really beneficial, I think, to be able to assess these things as you're collecting data, um, like real time, because mass spec is not cheap. Snagging instrument time can be tricky. Why waste uh, hours and dollars on data? It looks like crap anyway, um, is, my, is my sales pitch. Um, so it really, uh, like, I mean, just look at this basic workflow. You're starting with CSF. You're going to prep it. You're going to slap it on an instrument. Uh, you know, maybe you've had too many freeze thaws and you didn't realize it. Maybe your reagents are expired. Maybe you've got high protease activity. Maybe you've got poor recovery. Maybe your gradient's too long. Maybe your gradient's too short. Maybe your optics are dirty. Maybe your column is poorly packed. There are so many things. Um, so it really begs the question, can you trust your data? Um, and in case I haven't sold you on this, on this yet, uh, an anecdote. So my lab has been working on a project involving Alzheimer's disease in mouse models, and we were already kind of behind on the project, so we were in a hurry to collect data. So we kind of lightly, I would say, tested our preparation protocol and then went on our merry way. I had prepped and began running hundreds of samples. Um, and when we realized the reproducibility was complete garbage, um, we had to scrap all that data, completely reinvent the prep protocol, and more painfully, financially speaking, rerun all of those samples. Um, obviously, the protocol development still would have been required, but had we been closely tracking the data as it came off, uh, as it came off the instrument, we could have pumped the brakes way earlier and saved both time and money. And ultimately, we also used the controls that we that we came up with um, as tools to optimize that protocol as well. So I would like to ask you all the question, um, what controls do you implement in your own experiments? Um, think about that and maybe uh, post some stuff in the chat. I'm curious to see what other people do. Um, yeah, because I'm always, I'm, always, I'm always looking for more suggestions too because the more I can control my data, the, the, more, the less anxious I am. Um, so, Today, therefore, I will be talking to you about the ways in which you can assess the integrity of your experiment. Um, and the program that I am largely going to be demonstrating this with is Skyline, which is an open source software for analyzing mass spec data developed by my lab. Um, I will be giving a very brief orientation to it at one point, um, but if you have any questions about specific Skyline applications, how to use it in this context, let me know. I'm happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. Um, so these are what I believe to be the four important components of a well-tracked experiment. Um, first thing you've got is process control. So these are known quantities of proteins or peptides spiked into the samples at specific times to assess the sample preparation within a batch, and then to distinguish between preparation issues and MS analysis issues. Uh, second, you've got the system suitability. These are sometimes colloquially referred to as QCs. Um, perhaps because that's easy to pluralize than SSs. 
Um, but these allow you to assess system performance prior and during running your samples, as well as track system performance over a long period of time. Um, the other two components are common references and quality controls. So the common reference is typically a pool of all or a representative subset of your sample set, which is then later used for signal calibration and or normalization. Then the quality control, an actual quality control, uh, is used to assess between batch reproducibility. Um, and this can also be pooled samples or a pool of a similar matrix. Obviously, I'm going to go more in depth on all of these in a moment. But so there's sort of two, there's a difference, a main difference between the two sort of pairs um, is that the first two are tracked real time as the data is collected. Um, and I do it in Skyline. Um, and it's a useful tool for correcting errors quickly and optimizing, whereas the uh, second two are uh, focused on batch analysis and are done after the data has been collected. So we will be starting with process controls. Okay, so process controls. There's two sort of like basic modules. Um, first, you've got assessing the process of sample preparation. And by that, I mean like digestion, reducing, alkylating, whatever you're doing to the sample to get it, re to get it ready for mass spec analysis. Um, we use yeast enolase. Um, and then the second one is assessing the process of recovery and data collection, and also, which we use uh, these PRTC, PRTC peptides. And relatedly, uh, or more, perhaps more importantly, distinguishing between the two, um, should an issue arise because like using only one of the two is still super useful and helpful but I think it's like the tandem application that really allows you to figure out what's going on and I will explain more on that in a minute. Um, so process controls. What makes a good process control? Well like most things in life it depends. Um, first and foremost, uh, the matrix that you will be applying it is important. For example, we use yeast enolase in our human and mouse projects because it is dissimilar enough from any proteins present in the samples that we don't have to worry about convoluting. If you were, say, working with yeast, this would obviously be less effective. Um, we used to use heavy labeled uh, APOI1, um, but it's expensive, it's been discontinued, and it's also a lipid binding protein, which is really not ideal to be spiking into brain samples, as fatty as they are. So again, this is a protein that we were spiking in at the beginning of sample preparation and allows us to track the prep digestion and reproducibility because you're adding in a known quantity of this protein and it's getting the exact same treatment as all the other proteins in the sample. So in theory, your enolase peptides should just be like, you know, your peak area should just be straight across. Um, that gives you more confidence that any differences that you're seeing, uh, any, any quantitative differences you're seeing in your uh, peptides of experimental interest is actually due to biological variation and non-technical. Um, and then, and uh, these are, it's cheap, at least enolase is pretty cheap. So it's, it's, uh, it's accessible that way. Um, and it's, it can also be used to optimize sample prep protocols because if you say if you're comparing two different protocols and in one the yeast enolase is all over the place, but in the other one it's like really reproducible, that's a sign that maybe this prep is uh, more compatible with your matrix. So next, what we use to assess data collection, we use Pierce retention time calibrant or PRTC peptides. These are synthesized peptides based on yeast that have um, heavy labeled lysines and arginines. These are added right the samples added to the samples right before MS analysis. So like I add them to the auto sampler vials or the tips or whatever I'm using um, right before it goes on. So again, this is helpful for tracking LCMS performance because in theory, if even if your digestion was crap, as long as your instrument working your instrument system is working correctly, those should be super consistent. Um, unfortunately, they are not cheap. PRTC is pretty expensive, so I know that's not an option for anyone. Everyone. So let's say you found a protein you think you might want to use as a sample prep process control. It's cheap. You've demonstrated that it behaves reasonably well in your matrix. Um, what is next? Choosing your peptides. Um, so you've performed a digest of your process control protein, or perhaps you've secured piles and piles of money uh, to have special, special heavy labeled peptides made, uh, you need to choose the peptides that you're going to be monitoring in your samples. It's helpful to just have a few and not have to monitor like dozens. Um, so here's some things to consider when choosing your peptides to monitor. The baseline is that you need them, you want them to be reproducible. Um, so good peak area and shape consistently in your samples. Um, you also would like, it's also ideal to have them span a range of hydrophobicity because you want them to 
to come loot over the course of your entire gradient and not just come off all at the beginning or all at the end. Um, Cause you want to have an idea of what's going on for the whole thing. And ideally they're not going to be likely to have miscleavages. So like maybe avoiding having super acidic amino acids near the cleavage site, that's kind of nitpicky. And again, this is all in the matrix, like the one that you're working with. Um, and again, like I said, this, this is a pretty nitpicky list, depending on the limitations of your project or your resources, you might just need to pick whatever works well enough. Um, and also I will say that I use a lot of, um, I will say subjective terminology to dis uh, to describe like what uh, I'm look like looking for, what is good enough. And as a lab, we are currently working on developing a more uh, quantitative assessment sort of metric system. But for now, a lot of it's sort of like based on my own experience or the experience of others deciding whether or not I want to go forward with a certain experiment or a certain data set. Okay, so let's look at the PRC peptides, for example. Um, this is the list that you get with the product. Um, obviously, they don't have a huge amount of mass variation, but the range of hydrophobicity means they're going to spread out really nicely over the course of my gradient. Um, another disclaimer is that we probably don't get the most hydrophobic peptides because they probably get stuck on the trap. Um, but regardless, this is this is an example of something you could sort of to give you an idea of what you might want to do with your um, your own process control uh, peptide selection. So how do we choose our enolase peptides? Um, well, I'll tell you. Uh, in this case, we wanted to choose peptides that would behave well in a mouse brain tissue matrix. So and we decided to use DIA to uh, find these peptides because that is the acquisition method we'd be using with the experimental samples. We also wanted to see what ratio of process control protein to experimental experimental protein was appropriate, aka see how little we could get away with. Um, you have to save money where you can. Um, so the actual experiment, we prepped or I prepped um, 12 mouse brain samples, 50 micrograms each, with either 400 nanograms or 800 nanograms of enolase spiked in at the beginning. Um, and then reduced, alkylated, digested altogether. And then on the actual mass spec, six gas phrase, fractionated narrow window DIA injections for the library, then 12 individual wide window quant injections for the samples themselves. Um, then those narrow window injections were searched with Encyclopedia to generate a chromatogram library, then search the wide window injections against the library, also using Encyclopedia, um, generate a, li a library and uh, put it all into Skyline. Um, and then after importing that wide window data into the Skyline document, we can then look at the analyze peptides to see what performed best in the matrix. And I will now briefly orient you to Skyline if you are not familiar with it. Um, so this is what a typical Skyline document might look like, at least on my computer. Um, so Skyline is, the, is an open source software developed by my lab to analyze mass spec data. And you can analyze SRM, MRM, PRM, DIA, SWATH, DDA, all of it. Um, so anyway, a, a quick, a quick, to, a quick to tour. Uh, on the left, you've got your targets, um, you know, proteins, peptides. There's a window with your chromatograms in the middle, document grid below, which you can choose a variety of different uh, annotation. You can annotate using the document grid. Um, there's reports that you can choose from to give you different uh, information. Um, and then on the right, I've got replicate comparisons of retention time and peak area. So this is typically what it looks like from, like this is what a document will look like on my computer if I'm uh, assessing my process controls and also doing a more in-depth analysis. Um, and as you can see here, I have a entire protein selected, which is what I'm seeing um, in the chromatogram window and in the retention time and peak area window. But you can also just look at the peptides individually. Um, and this, in this way, I'm able to look at the peak for this particular peptide, the retention time across the replicates, peak area, et cetera. Okay, so that was here. And in this case, this is, I'm, I'm looking at, this is the document that I used to determine what peptides I'd be using for enolase. Um, so as you can see, there's a variety to choose from, and I chose from that from that list the ones that seemed reproducible and spanned a, a good range of the gradient. And then I just deleted everything else. Um, so um, if you want to learn more about this, 
check it out online. Um, so using enolase and PRTC peptides or in, together in tandem. Um, so maybe I've maybe I'm using all of the PRTC peptides on the list. Maybe I've just selected a few that cover a good range of my gradient that I want to look at. I've selected some enolase peptides that I also want to be monitoring. Um, I prefer to combine them into one document. So say I've got my, like I said, I've got my uh, enolase peptides, I've got my PRTC peptides, which I have to enter manually into Skyline, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and then I combine them together into one document. You don't have to do this. You could keep them in two separate documents or however you, else you want to do it. Um, but uh, I like them, I prefer them in one document. Um, and the reason I like this is because I think it's the comparison of the PRTC versus the enolase that gives me actual like really uh, help a, a good idea of what's what could be going wrong if something is going wrong. Um, so I will give you an example to show you what I mean by this. Um, so here is a Skyline document. Um, as you can see, again, I've got my targets on the left, chromatogram, and then replicate comparison. You also might notice that there is some, there's a uh, APOI1 protein left in this document. I should have deleted it, but I am lazy and didn't. Um, so it's not going to change anything. It's just not going to be helpful because there's no actual APOI1 in any of these samples. Um, so it's not going to, there's not going to be any good data on that. Um, so this is a PRTC peptide, um, which I will not try and verbalize, but this looks good. Um, you know, I, a little bit of retention time drifting, but I'm not too upset about it. Good, consistent peak area. Peak shape, great. Um, and then this is another PRTC peptide. And again, this is the thing that I spiked in right before it went on the instrument. A little bit more retention time drifting, but I'm still not really upset about it. At this point, I would be saying, I, I'd feel confident that my LCMS system is uh, working pretty well. Um, so how do the enolase peptides look? Less good. Um, Say, you know, there's a bit more retention time drifting and all, and obviously those peak areas are not, not nearly as consistent as I would like. I would like them to look how the PRTC peptides looked. Um, and another enolase peptide, okay, also looks bad. So clearly something went wrong, but I don't think it has anything to do with my LC or my, or my mass spec. Um, maybe, uh, maybe my digestion, maybe, but you know, maybe I had an expired reagent or something, but Either way, I've already narrowed down the source of the issue. I'm not gonna bother futzing with the LLC or anything like that. I'm just gonna go back, look at my prep, my prep protocol and see if I can figure out where it went wrong. Um, Cause also, as you can see the peak shape for this one that is where it is present in the sample, that peak shape looks good. Um, so again, that sort of reaffirms the idea that my LCMS system is in fact uh, working. And this is just one application of process controls. You know. Uh, you can, again, we, we used, we use this to optimize our, our sample prep protocol quickly by, like I said, if you had like three different, uh, protocols you wanted to look at and really quickly, you just looked at how enolase, how, how the enolase, uh, reproducibility is, uh, in three different prep protocols and one, it's really consistent and the other one, it's all over the place already. You have a, you have a better idea of which protocol is going to work better with your matrix, or it can also help you just fine tune, um, that prep protocol as well. Like, you know, the, the, as you change things, the reproducibility gets better and better. Um, so yeah, that is process controls. Um, and next I will be talking about the system suitability, um, which is another real time uh, data assessment tool. So along with tracking instrument performance over a long period, they can also help you identify LCMS systems, LCMS system issues uh, at a more discrete level. Um, oh, this poll just popped up, eh, go away. Um, excuse me, sorry. Uh, oh. Okay, system suitability. Um, what makes a good system suitability? Uh, this one doesn't depend as much, it's, it's pretty universal. Um, in general, you want it to be a stable sample that doesn't change with time. You want it to be similar to your actual samples. So whether that's small molecules, peptides, proteins, whatever. Minimal carryover is ideal. Um, and so it doesn't dirty your instrument. 
it's good if it's cheap. Um, and ideally you can also buy it commercially. It's quality controlled and you can buy it in bulk. You want basically, you want it to have minimal preps. You can just buy it, slap it on the instrument. Um, so we use a mix of PRTC, PRTC and uh, BSA digested in bulk. Obviously the PRTC aspect of it, not very cheap, but you could totally just use BSA peptides and that's excellent, um, works well. We just use PRTC because we're fancy. Um, so uh, like applying system suitability and actually assisting system, assessing system performance. A lot of S's in this presentation. Um, when I say assess system performance, what I mean is I want to be able to look at my data. I want to be look at my instrument and, and see that the peptide intensities, both precursor and product ions, are within tolerated variance over time. I want the art retention time and peak shape. I want to make sure it's acceptable. And I want to be able to track mass accuracy, again, over a long period of time. Um, and like I said, it's especially if it's applied over a long period of time can give you an accurate idea of how your system should be performing. Um, you know, maybe you see your peak area is gradually decreasing over, over a few months, you know, it might be time to clean the optics. Um, Cause generally if you have, you know, um, if you have an idea of what you should be seeing, it's easier to identify when problems arise. Um, you know, you, you know what peak areas, what retention times, et cetera, what amount of variation you can expect to see. Um, I also, uh, and also, it, and, it, and it can also provide a more granular look at the potential sources of system error without wasting precious sample. Because, you know, if you start with, if you're starting, if the first sample you put on is a really important sample and your spray stability looks like crap, that's unfortunate because you've already injected that sample. Um, so this is why I find it particularly useful to front load a sample set with at least four system suitability injections before any samples run. Um, this gives, not the anthropomorphize, but this gives the LC a moment to just figure itself out because sometimes she needs a moment. Um, and also lets me identify quickly any major issues before I actually thaw out, even thaw out my, my individual samples, you know, jagged peaks, like I said, maybe you've got sprain stability, overloaded column, et cetera. I oftentimes, I won't even put my actual samples in the auto sampler until the first four have run and look good, especially if I'm gonna be injecting um, equilibration samples as well. So an example of what this can look like in a Skyline document um, in terms of tracking it over time. So this is several system suitability injections over the course of different batches, projects, uh, people, um, and because of the multiple points over time, you can clearly see where something changed in the system output. I will admit this is a fairly obvious example. Um, sometimes it's more subtle, but clearly some, something has changed. Although interestingly, you know, the retention times haven't shifted that much, um, but the peak area looks less good. Um, so something something is a, a, a foot, a miss. Um, and I would not obviously would not want to continue on with my actual data analysis if the peak area, if the sensitivity seems to be changing this much. Um, and especially if you set up auto QC, this is an incredibly low effort way to keep tabs on your system because you can just periodically open up your system suitability skyline file and your raw files will have been automatically imported. It's lovely. And on that note, a brief word from our sponsor, not really, but I am gonna plug Panorama and AutoQC a little bit. So Panorama is an open source repository server application for targeted mass spectrometry assays that integrates into a Skyline mass spec workflow. So basically it's a place where you can put your data and look at it. Um, and there is a Panorama AutoQC pipeline. So the, it, re it really lets you look at, again, the performance over time, and it, it's got like three, three components. It's got Skyline, then the Panorama server, and then the auto QC loader, which is a utility program that automates the processing of op uploading. And by QC, sorry, it should be called, it really should be called um, auto SS, not auto QC, but again, people colloquially refer, them to, refer, refer to them as QCs, even though they are not. Um, so it, auto, it automates the uploading of system suitability results. Um, the pipeline is initialized by specifying the following. So you got a template document with the target system suitability peptides like the one I just showed you um, into which the raw data files should be imported as they are required. As they are required. Um, so, and then the, and this, so then the Skyline document containing those system suitability results are then uploaded automatically to Panorama um, 
into like a dashboard where you can look at a variety of charts um, that show several metrics like retention time, peak area, other stuff. Um, so like this is what your dashboard might look like if you've got various instruments and you can really quickly look to see, you know, is auto QC even on? Is it running? Um, are they being uploaded? And, and it's a it's a quick glance uh, assessment of how everything is doing. And furthermore, when you actually open up, say, one of these um, instruments, you can look at all sorts of really cool plots. You've got Levi Jennings plots, moving range plots. You can select between metrics like retention time shown here or peak area, mass accuracy, all sorts of really, really cool things you can look at. Um, and you can look at it like, like this over a very, very long period of time. So it's cool. Um, how to get AutoQC, if you go to panoramaweb.org, um, you go to the right and documentation and go down, there is a, there's much, much, much resources and tutorials on how to get and install AutoQC and get it going. Um, and there's also lots of summaries and tutorials and much documentation. So highly recommend checking that out if you're interested in it. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, so like I said, I like to front load with, um, at least for system suitability injection. So like, what would this look in a hypothetical? Uh, so let's say this is my auto sampler tray. Um, and I, let's say I've got 16 samples, experimental samples I wanna analyze. This is what it would look like when I set it up. So I've got my four system suitability injections to start. I'd run maybe six individual samples, another system suitability, another six system suitability, finish out the experimental samples and wrap it up with another system suitability because you wanna finish strong. Um, and I typically intersperse the system suitability injections every six to eight uh, experimental samples. And it can depend on um, gradient length as well. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what, this is what a typical uh, design would look like for, for me. Um, so like I said, the, the probably the strongest um, benefit of the system suitability injections is to be able to look at stuff over a long period of time, but there is it is also beneficial to look at it just like within one experiment um, in like real time as, as stuff is coming off. So um, especially especially if you schedule at least a few before any of your experimental samples run. Um, so here's an example of that kind of an action. So here is a, um, this, so, oh, sorry. This is a uh, system suitability injection or, or several. So you can see I've got the four, the first four, and again, should say SS, not QC. Um, I'm not super upset about, you know, there's a little bit of retention time drifting. Honestly, that's pretty good. Usually it's a little all over the place for the first four. Um, and at this point I wouldn't stop analysis. That being said, if I looked at the chromatograms, I don't like that. Um, that's obviously very jagged. I don't really know what's going on. Um, maybe, Maybe my column is overloaded. Maybe it's not ionizing very well. Regardless, at this point, I think I scheduled those two other system suitability injections five and six, hoping it would figure itself out because of, oftentimes that is how I solve LCMS systems is I just leave it alone, <laughs> um, but it didn't. So I ended up having to stop everything and uh, troubleshoot the LC, but I was able to do that without ever even thawing out samples that I cared about. Um, so that, that's another application in which it's, it's useful real time, but also over a long period of time. So, okay, I have covered the two components that can be assessed, like I said, real time as the data comes off the instrument. Um, I will now be talking about the two controls that are employed once the data has been collected. And we're gonna start off with the common reference, which you can also call batch reference, global reference, lots of different things. Um, we again typically create this by pooling all or a representative subset of the experimental samples, though you could also use a pool of a similar matrix. Um, so an example of how, to, how we would construct a, a batch reference. So say you're prepping three batches of brains, hippocampal tissue or something. Um, as long as your batches are well balanced and they should be, um, and any one batch is a decent representation of the sample set, and it should be, um, you could pull one of those batches at the beginning to then use as your batch reference. So you take those samples, you pull them, you aliquot them, and then those are added to each batch as an additional sample to be prepped alongside all of the rest of them. Like getting all the, all the, all the same treatment. Um, so why, you might ask. Um, 
at the end of the day, mass spec is not inherently calibrated. Uh, and internal standards may not actually account for all the variation introduced in the workflow in, into the workflow. Um, but the good thing is scales can be arbitrary because like most things. Um, and as long as the point that everything is being compared to is the same, it doesn't actually matter what the point is. Um, although in the setting, obviously you want it to be of a, of, of a, a similar thing. You don't want to be like, you know, use some random tissue that has nothing to do with what you're prepping. Um, because <clears throat> everything is relative. Um, and the end goal is something like this, which is converting, converting signal from an analytical, any analytical measurement into a more meaningful value by calibrating it relative to a reference standard. So this puts all the values onto the same scale, regardless of methodology, location, instrumentation, user, et cetera. Um, just more, more meaningful data. And how do you achieve said sweet, sweet uh, data harmony? Um, well, here's a visual representation. So starting with figure A, you can see the upper line is measurements from site A. So you've got EA, orange, the orange square, or X, not square, um, is the experimental sample. Then C prime A, green, is a local reference. And then CA, the gray X, is the common reference, global standard, global reference, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the lower line is the same thing, but collected at a different site, site B. So clearly, uh, signal from si signal from samples collected um, at site A are on a different scale compared to those collected at site B. But are they actually different? Um, we'll find out. So to harmonize these signals, we're going to set a common scale relative to the common reference CA and CB. So while the signal might not be measured on the same absolute scale, as long as these reference materials are the same, are the same sample, say aliquots from the same pool, they should represent the same quantity. Um, as long as you haven't done something absolutely insanely weird to them. Um, and so once you've done that, as you can see in figure C, the signals measured for batch A and batch B are calibrated by reporting their signal relative to the reference material signal, giving you a, a, a more uh, meaningful representation of their relative um, signal. Um, and then also, so in cases necessitating a local working reference material, so C prime, experimental samples could be first calibrated to the local working reference and then secondarily calibrated to the global reference. Um, and how I do this in Skyline, um, this is just one way to do it and this is how I do it. Um, so again, you've got uh, your Skyline software uh, document. There is like in that document grid that I mentioned, you can annotate various various things. And one of those annotations that you can choose from is setting what your sample type is. So that's gonna be either an unknown, a standard quality control solvent, et cetera. And so I, what I do is I set this batch reference sample, I set that to, um, to be the standard, and then I set its analyte concentration to be one. Um, so by doing that, um, it, so it, it, it then allows me to generate this table. So this, what you see in the top of the table is the calculated concentration, ignore the mean part, um, for each peptide and, and replicate. And um, the number that you're seeing is a number relative to one indicating how it compares to the same peptide in the standard replicate. Um, so then you can do this to, you know, if you've got like two batches or whatever, you can then do this to both batches. And then you can actually look at the differences you can actually compare those two those two data sets to each other more meaningfully um, because they're relative to the same uh, reference standard. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite quite useful in that way. And again, this is just a really easy and helpful application in Skyline itself. Um, so yes, that was uh, the common reference or global reference or whatever. Um, Finally, last but not least, though I will admittedly be talking the least about it, um, is quality controls. And this is actual quality controls this time. So these are typically a pooled sample um, of or a similar matrix, so in the, which are then added to each batch as an additional sample to be prepped. Existentially, they're, they're the same as um, the common reference, but their application is different. Um, so how, how might you actually use these um, in theory? So again, this is a sample that you have, some that you pooled, 
and then you prepped it alongside all of your other samples and it's the same out it's a it's aliquots of the same pool in each batch so what you're looking at this is a plot um of is a log two of peptide intensities so like peak area of of two batch qcs uh hrpr1 and hrpr2 um so and they're again these prepared in two different batches so we know between batches there's going to be some variability they aren't identical, they're, so they're not gonna be identical, but they should be pretty similar. So by measuring the correlation between HRPR1 and HRPR2, we're assessing how similar they actually are. Um, ideally, it would just be one, you know, you'd want an R of one, but it's not reality. Um, but this is pretty good, um, 0.93. Uh, I, I feel like I can trust that there's not a huge amount of technical variation between these two batches as a whole. Uh, and furthermore, uh, using these correlation plots, um, oops, I meant to emphasize that, but yeah, as you can see, but also um, you can figure out if your normalization method is working. Um, on the far right, after uh, SVA normalization, the correlation gets even tighter. So that means that the batch correction is doing its job. Um, so yes, and, and uh, so assessing correlation tells us whether or not we're reducing the technical variation, which is desirable. Uh, and again, you can use Skyline to do this. That's how I do it. You can use the document grid once again. You can generate a uh, just mean normalized area of, I've got the samples on the top, and then there's a list of peptide, all of the peptides present, which you can't really see on the far left. Then their normalized peak area for each one. I can export that into a CSV. This is just a useful document in general, um, but depending on your level of our finesse, um, you can make a correlation plot, just like a kind of a, a really quick brute force one. Um, I think I just like joined by peptide and then log two'd and then made this. And already it took me 10 minutes and it already is giving me an idea of what's going on. So 0.88, R of 0.887, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, I feel like there's not a huge amount of too, too much variation between um, these two batches. And I could use this again to like reduce, you know, perhaps changing things in my protocol to reduce the variation between my batches. Um, so an example of how, an example of sort of um, these two things, uh, batch reference and batch QC in one of our, in one of our current projects, like how you might, how the design might look. Um, so we have this large scale CSF project. There is a total of 421 CSF samples comprised of these three groups and their varying uh, numbers. And then uh, we're gonna be prepping these in 96 well plates using SP3 on a automated Kingfisher. So the we're gonna pool the experimental samples or probably a representative subset into a pool and then aliquoting that out. Um, and then we'll be using store-bought healthy pooled CSF as that batch QC. And then each row of the 96 well plate will have both a batch QC and a batch reference in it. This might seem like overkill to treat like, um, like each row as like a batch within a batch, but 96 well plates open up a lot of room to introduce technical error. Um, even if you have godly pipetting skills, uh, of which I don't, multi-channel pipettes are way more prone to error. And it's also possible even just, you know, say you're, you have to heat the plate up, the corners of the plate are gonna be more susceptible to temperature changes and other, and other stuff. So by having this many controls, um, we can account for more of that. So this is like, again, like basically the same thing, but just uh, showing what the different groups are. So in conclusion, um, you should use as many controls as, reason as reasonably possible, emphasis on reasonably. I know that this isn't an option for every for everyone or everything every project um but i will and this is the part where it really gets into my opinion but um what i believe to be the essential controls would be system suitability you need to be monitoring your instrument performance by some metric if you if you aren't able to do that i don't understand how you can trust any of your data um i would say the important controls so like really great to have um Process controls to assess the preparation and some LCMS system functionality within batches. I think those are really, really helpful for knowing, again, like being able to be confident that the variation that you're seeing is not just technical. Um, 
The common references, again, very helpful to calibrate data and ensure the data can actually be compared meaningfully across the batches and lab or other labs, et cetera. And then a really good idea controls, in my humble opinion, um, is the batch QC is to assess between batch reproducibility. Um, and yes, yeah, so like I said, as many of these as you can reasonably do, that's what uh, that's what I what I believe in. And this poll keeps popping up in front of me. I'm sorry, I'm not a tech wizard. And by tech wizard, I mean I fail at basic things such as Zoom. Anyway, um, acknowledgments. Thank you to everyone in my lab who has um, always been so helpful with figuring out, or at least listening to me as I uh, commis or commiserating over data not working or LCMA systems not working, which seems to happen all the time. Um, and also, of course, uh, Stoyan for asking me to do this presentation and Risen Biosciences for giving me the opportunity. I'm excited to talk about this stuff. I think it's important. And I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm excited that I got to do this. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Julia. This, that was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, already, already there was there was some nice discussion in the chat. So um, we're gonna come back to that one, uh, Lindsay. If you're still around, stay with us. I want to activate your mic, and then we have a bit of a discussion about some of the things you posted. I think they they're quite important. But but maybe we can get to the first two questions that were that's already in the Q and A section. So Justin asked if you um, you use any sort of um, limb systems to monitor expiry of reagents. And track reagents, or do you use your your process and system stability controls and so on to to understand? Well, if something is fired, obviously you'll see it in the methods or your sample prep. Um, you know, having an issue there. Um, not so. We don't track the expiry with any sort of like, uh, like you know, we don't use the instruments to do anything like that. The reason I, I even mention that is because one of my experiments, I was trying to do this comprehensive protocol experiment where I was comparing, I did four different preps all in one day at the same time to see like which was the best. And uh, one of the preps just completely failed and I thought I'd screwed something up. And then I, so I tried it again and it failed again. And it turns out that uh, RapiGest that I was using was expired and I just should have read the vial. <laughs> um, so that was on me. Um, but that's just like that's just kind of like human error that you can introduce by way of not reading the box, which you should. <laughs> Don't be like me. Um, but we are actually, in terms of uh, tracking sort of like re reagents and protocols and stuff, we're actually looking at this um, website software thing called protocols.io. I don't know if anyone has experiment experience with that, but we are perhaps going to be implementing it as part of our. Uh, way of, of keeping track of protocols and experiments um, because it's got really good version control apparently and we're big on that. Yeah, that sounds cool. Let's actually check it out. Um, and then we had a question from, from Vinny. Um, do you want to read it out? Is there an impact from injecting SSPs from the same vial versus independent vials? Um, oh, I definitely prefer to have it be the same vial. So I, um yeah for if i'm if i'm using like a so the lc that the two lcs that i have the most experience with are um the easy lcs from thermo and then i've also been using the evocep um recently and the reason those are they're, they're different because the evocep you're actually using individual tips so you can't double dip so i have to make uh the system suitabilities uh separately which i don't really like just because again that's introducing more differences whereas i was if, ideally if you can have it just going into the same vial that's much better okay and that's actually a question i had um when you have the same instrument but two different lc's that you're juggling would you set up two different uh kind of system stability files to follow your standards or do you keep it as one because i mean if you go from evocep to something else the, the chromatography performance is completely different so that's actually something that we're trying to figure out um, because we, we just got the EvoCEP in, I think it was February, and yeah. there has been much, much learning of its idiosyncrasies. Um, I think in theory, 
if if we're able to to calculate accurate if we have calculated accurately how much to like load onto the tips as would be flowing through a column um, with your standard like system suitability injection it should look like the peak area should look the same but the retention times might be different um especially because like the gradient lengths are probably at least a little bit different um but i i think yeah that's right right now we're also i i, I preach all this as if we have a perfect system but our we're in the process of really nailing down the actually getting everyone to put their files like into the put their system suitability injection files into like the same document because everyone at this point some people have their own or there's yeah. like one for the for the computer that some people use so it's been you need more figuring uh, that out automation <laughs> basically yeah yeah it's uh we're, we're still we're still trying to figure that out and then so. then then we have the question uh, from Lindsay. i'm going to actually activate Lindsay. don't worry if, if you're not going to activate your camera so you can be in your pajamas uh but uh we can activate your mic also um and, and so Lindsay basically had a question about uh, internal standard digestion controls mm -hmm. but is not really sure of how best to use them um so because some peptides might digest worse or better with the recording so do you just fix some of the predetermined peptides or use those to normalize and if you example the monitor multiple peptides and one peptide increases abundance of another decreases how would that be normalized mm. So my, my question is that would you use a, a process control to normalize the data or do you just use it to uh, monitor your sample prep essentially? If it's, if it's well, I suppose you can do both. Um, I, I, I think what we're, there's uh, at least Jay, I think in our lab has done some work on whether or not we can actually use like the internal standards to, to normalize. But in general, I just use it as a way to determine whether or not my digestion went well. Um, or that my system's working. Um, and that's kind of as to um, but like the predetermined peptides, like that's that's that was the whole like enolase experiment where I I looked at all of the peptides across these um, all the peptides that I saw uh, in the brain samples from the enolase that were digested, and I chose the ones that seem to be the most reproducible in each sample. That being said, um, we use enolase for and, and that has just become our our main uh, process control, like internal process control. But we really only uh, test it in brain, so we know it works really well in brain. It is entirely possible that it really doesn't work that well for other tissues or whatever. So I think it's important to before you start applying the process control to make sure it's going to actually be digested well in the matrix that you're working with. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um... Lindsay, do you want to add anything to that? Um... No, I was just kind of curious. I mean, it's something we've started spiking into all of our samples or even just monitoring some protein that some housekeeping protein that should be present everywhere um, and using that even instead of having an external standard spiked into the sample um, like you're doing with yeast and human. And I was just like, as we're looking at the data, it's just like, I, I realize now I don't actually know how I'm supposed to use this. Like, like if I, I look at multiple peptides in a protein, some might increase abundance, some might decrease abundance. Well, does that mean my digestion went okay? Or should I do something with the data? Should I include some proteins that are missed cleavages to get i don't know like a ratio or something if i track the two individual protein uh mm -hmm. the two individual peptides and then the miscleaved form of those two could i use that as a ratio somehow i don't know i don't know open question i don't have an answer i don't know what i'm doing well no i, I think those are those are actually questions that we should probably be asking too because uh we um we came up with i think the I think we, we switched over to using yeast enolase like a two years ago. It's all blur, like with, especially with COVID, it's all like blurring together. Um, Cause like I said, we used to use the um, human APOI one, but we, the actual process of like figuring out what to use was pretty speedy. <laughs> like it was like, okay, this works. 
these peptides seem reproducible, let's go. Um, I think a lot of the nuances of, and, and stuff like that, like the more intricate uh, applications you can use, we have not really explored at all. It's just, it's just been a tool of like, does this look like, excuse my French, shit? No, cool, I'm not gonna stop the instrument. <laughs> Yeah, I could see like if it's if every single peptide is just not present or super super low abundance, then I would probably be like, okay, yeah, we should pull this sample or just ex exclude this sample from our analyses. Um, but if it's more nuanced, if it's you know some peptides go up, some peptides don't go down, can't explain it. Um, what what do you do then? Can you salvage that data? Is it going to be an outlier when you do your analysis? Are they going to cluster together? Like if you were to cluster across a whole bunch of samples, cluster on those digestion kinetics by themselves. Sorry to give you homework if I'm giving you homework. No, um, this is good. I need to give a notebook. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious if you would end up seeing trends across samples or across batches that could be used for normalizing the data. That's a really good point. Damn it, Lindsay. <laughs> I just want you to do it so I don't have to do it. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Also, what in the process control, would we want to have a single protein or have to cover a bit of the dynamic range? So have spike two or three proteins at different levels. Right, um, exactly. Yeah. Do you um, want to include, make sure you're including peptides with cysteine so that you can track how well reduction in alkylation went as well? Yeah. Um, I don't know, things that I've been thinking of, and I just. I if I look time. at the commercial example of Digestive, which, which company is selling, they, they basically have made a, like a synthetic protein, but they have peptides that are difficult to digest and hard to, and easy to digest, and that's for a medium digestion. And they, they would monitor how you know, the easy, medium, and hard digestion sites are being cleaved. Um, so there probably is some value to, to make sure that the peptides we monitor are not just the easiest ones to digest. Right. Because then right. we might be missing, um, you know, uh, part of the picture. Um, right. Yeah, because if, if it's only digesting like the super open, huge parts, it's already really well digested. Exactly. Yeah, you're only 10 sense. minutes and the thing is, you think it's fully digested yet. Right. Um, um, so you're not point. giving the full picture. Um, so I think uh, those are the questions for now. Uh, it, Please, guys, post your questions. We have time if you want to. And uh, just on the polls, so uh, Julie, I don't know if you can see the polls, but um, so on this one, uh, uh, thankfully, everybody is using some kind of control. And most of this probably as expected. The system suitability one is the most common one being used. So at least we are checking the, you know, the performance of our mass spec, which is, which is good. Um, um, mm -hmm. And only 8% are using all of the different controls that you, that you described. Um, I suppose some of them also overlap um, in terms of what what they can what they can do with them, um, but but it's good that that uh, people are starting to use this, this type of controls in their in their setup to monitor the experiments. Um, yeah, the other poll we had was about uh, the number of samples being typically processed, and fifty percent of the people had uh, sample sets from twenty to fifty. Which is already moving away from what proteomics was, I think, uh, maybe even five years ago, where typical sample set would be like three to five replicas per condition. So this is definitely moving and increasing. Um, and 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 actually, eighty percent of people are saying that they want to scale the experiments in the future. So these kind of controls, um, you know, will become more and more important as the data sets um, uh, increase. Um, uh, and and the third question was, do you take your instrument performance over time? And 95% of the people said yes. So uh, one, one person said, depending on size of the study, uh, suppose if it's a very small study, you don't want to care about how the instrument is performing over time, but then how do you know if it's actually performing well for your particular samples? Because as you said, everything is relative and the same, actually two types of instruments, the same, the same, uh, model will perform very differently from each other next to each other yep yep um so as you said they have their own characters and they need to um yeah be uh, be monitored individually um it, it does yeah. seem to like that especially in our lab um we are moving further and further towards like trying to develop really high throughput uh stuff like i think 
we're even looking at getting some like a sonicator that can do like 96 well um yeah. plates which is exciting <laughs> um but yeah like the and and the, the more you can because like yeah like the, the larger your batch size is and if you even have like still have six 96 sample batches it's like Oh, and how, and how do you, um, especially for our, for our DIA um, data, how do you like search, how, how do you compare all of them, especially like if you're, if like, you know, in terms of like making a library, like, I don't know how many, how many people are doing DIA, but like typically again, like we'll do like a batch gets a library, but if you have a library for each batch, but you want to compare all 500 or whatever samples to each other, how do you make, do you like combine the library somehow? Do you have like one master library? Do you choose the best one? Yeah. Um, those are other questions to ask, but. Yeah, I agree with you. And we, we, we've uh, taken the task of, of, of doing a validation study of 2000 samples of patients. And it's really scary of how, how what's, what we didn't envision as a bottleneck in the sample prep immediately becomes one. You know, it's a simple drying step uh, mm -hmm. of a thousand page of samples um, all of a sudden becomes a major bottleneck. So you have to actually optimize your workflow to exclude that step ideally. Last chance for uh, anybody to post questions, raise hands, some put something in the chat. If not, um, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank you, Julia, for this actually early morning for you. Um, and, and <laughs> it's early for me. <laughs> relatively speaking, relatively speaking, eight o'clock, I suppose, not too bad. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the presentation and, and hopefully it's been, it's been good for the rest of the people that joined us. As I said, we'll make it available offline so you can rewatch it and share it if you find it useful. And um, yeah, on and onwards we go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.